from ABC News. A television event. 100 years in the making. Essentially. In July 1969, nearly a million people gathered on a steamy Florida morning, hoping to see a dream realized that's as old as man's imagination. Among them, virtually unrecognized, a silver-haired flyer from another time. In 1927, Charles Lindbergh had guided his simple single-engine plane on a celebrated journey across the ocean and into history. And here, only 42 years later, three men are waiting to go to the moon on the most powerful machine man has ever built. Lindbergh wrote later to one of the Apollo 11 astronauts, my chest was beating and the ground shook as though bombs were falling nearby. And then a flame rose, leaving the ground behind, a meteor streaking the sky. It seemed impossible for life to exist while carrying that fire. What a fantastic experience it must have been, Lindbergh wrote, alone, looking down on another celestial body like a god of space. To be alone, and then return to one's fellow man once more. Tonight on the century, heaven and earth. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. I thought that was the dumbest thing I'd ever heard of in my life because we did not have the uh, facilities, we did not have the rocket engines, we did not have the life support systems, we didn't have the interest systems. Many of the engineers in America's struggling space program were stunned by the president's proposal. Kennedy's commitment meant sending men 240,000 miles out into space. I couldn't believe it. I said, what, we're going to the moon? Gone, that's quite an undertaking, you know. Well, now we're going to do it. For me, it was just a, a staggering kind of a thing because what we were proposing to do was so much larger, so much more powerful, so much more capable than anything that we'd even tried to do in, in the Mercury days. I was uh, down in the trenches. I was trying to look upward and trying to find a way to put a man in space, period. Putting a man on the moon was something that to me was inconceivable. Inconceivable because until the 1960s, America's rocket program was not a success story. We had a lot of failures, and most people don't realize how many rocket failures we had. Up until the time, yeah, 1960, over half of them failed in very, very spectacular kinds of ways. Astronaut John H. Glenn Jr. goes into final rehearsal as the day approaches for America's first manned orbital flight a flight that should put the United States on even terms with the Soviet Union in the space race. In February 1962, when John Glenn waited to launch in Friendship 7 on top of an Atlas rocket, NASA's rocket team knew only too well that during the previous tries, the Atlas had worked three times and failed twice. Two of the five previous Atlases had failed, Mercury Atlas 1 and 3. I didn't get the job done, so when we launched John Glenn, we didn't know whether we'd have the third bad one or the fourth good one. Think about an Atlas rocket, which is full of a couple of hundred thousand pounds of super cold liquid oxygen and kerosene. It's basically a bomb ready to go off at any moment. John Glenn's famous joke was he looked around and thought about the fact that everything was built by the lowest bidder. Godspeed, John Glenn. Oh, that view is tremendous. There's been 
nothing like it in history. 35 years ago, Gotham went wild over Lindbergh when he returned from his solo hop across the Atlantic. And there have been many wild receptions to returning heroes since. But today, tops them all. As Colonel John H. America was delighted with its newest space hero. But to get to the moon, NASA had to build a rocket 25 times as powerful as the one that took up John Glenn. Kennedy saw a prototype of this new rocket when he visited the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. The entire Apollo program depended on developing a moon rocket called the Saturn. In the last 24 hours, we have felt the ground shake and the air shattered by the testing of a Saturn C-1 booster rocket, many times as powerful as the Atlas which launched John Glenn. Kennedy's decision led to almost warlike mobilization of financial and human resources. NASA budget went at 80% the first year, 100% the second year. We made capital investments in building facilities all over the country. We created a new space center in Houston. So this was a really peaceful equivalent of, of a war campaign to get this done. Nothing was more important than creating the massive Saturn rocket. It was huge. The design and the engines, you know, were beyond state of the art, let's say. It was tremendous. I mean, you cannot appreciate that till you see the size of a man stacked up against that whole thing. But very quickly, the Saturn program fell behind schedule. And in 1963, an engineer named George Miller was put in charge of the manned flight program. He was not very optimistic about meeting the president's deadline. If you just looked at the schedule of what had to be done in order to get to the moon in that decade, there was only one way to do it, and that is to go for all-up testing of the vehicle. All-up testing. It was a radical approach to rocket development it meant that various stages of the rocket would no longer be tested one piece at a time, which was the safe way to go, but all the pieces would be put together and tested for the first time when the rocket took off, if it did. The people at NASA were incredulous that anyone could propose to take a, a brand new rocket and fire it with more than one stage at a time. George Miller convinced us not with a technical argument but with a psychological argument. He said, you guys, you are so good. You have so much experience. You are the best team in the world. You can do it. I have the full confidence and trust in you that you can do it and you will. The all-up concept saved two years in the schedule, but it still took six years to build. The moment of truth came in the fall of 1967 when the Saturn V rolled out to the launch pad at Cape Canaveral for its first unmanned flight. This was to be an all-up test of the most powerful machine ever built by man. 28 stories high, six and a half million tons, with the explosive power of an atom bomb. The Saturn V really represents the audaciousness of trying to send people to the moon. It's sort of NASA's answer to the pyramids. 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence five. It was an explosion of light and color that was meant. It wasn't a sound as you ordinarily think of sound. It was as if your whole body was vibrating. And at the center of all this is this object the size of a Navy destroyer, very slowly starting to lift off. You just wonder if it's ever going to get off the launch pad. I mean, you take a look at this guy just thundering away, just those engines straining, going like hell. The fact that it can lift seven and a half million pounds from dead standstill to 10 times faster than a 30 out 6 rifle bullet in less than 10 minutes. Now that is, that's an amazing machine. This was at once extraordinary violence and at the same time utterly controlled violence. You 
were standing there watching this rocket leave the ground and this fire coming out the back of it. And it's all happening in this eerie silence. And then, just as the rocket starts to clear the tower, shockwave, sound, hits you. And it is the loudest thing you've ever heard. Within a minute after liftoff, the whole rocket is going faster than the speed of sound. And it is just tearing through the atmosphere on its way into space. The first unmanned test flight of the Saturn was successful from beginning to end. Five months later, the second was not. The rocket developed vibrations so severe that in the second stage, the fuel lines were severed and the engines shut down in mid-flight. It was not hard to imagine things going wrong with astronauts on board. While NASA struggled to build a rocket powerful enough to reach the moon, there was more to do. No one had been in space for more than a few hours. During the Gemini program, Ed White was the first American to walk in space, tethered carefully to his capsule. In a lot of ways, Gemini now looks like the sort of barnstorming era of spaceflight because people were trying really amazing things. I mean, they were going up there and docking two ships together, and then they would, one guy would go outside and, and attach a tether from one to the other, and then they'd see if they could undock and get the two ships spinning just to create artificial gravity as an experiment. A moon mission depended on successfully having two spacecraft rendezvous and dock in orbit. In December 1965, Gemini 6 and 7 showed that rendezvous was possible. They maneuvered to within a few feet of each other. Right now, uh, 6 is about 10 feet above and to left the 7. We're just flying a nose to nose. Three months later, Neil Armstrong and Dave Scott docked their Gemini 8 capsule with an Agena rocket. But then things began to go wrong. It looked like a perfect mission. Here they were, they'd accomplished the very first space docking. And then all of a sudden, Dave Scott looked at the instrument panel and saw that their horizon indicator was tilted. A jet thruster used to maneuver the capsule stuck open, causing the capsule and the rocket to begin spinning wildly out of control. They managed to separate, but then the capsule started to spin even faster. The Earth and the Sun were spinning past the window, and it got to the point where Dave Scott has said that he was starting to experience tunnel vision. And that's a sign that the G-forces were becoming intolerable. If they had not gotten it under control, I would say within the next few minutes, maybe, they would have lost consciousness. Armstrong's skill as a test pilot saved the mission, but NASA engineers were shaken. This was a reminder of how dangerous space could be. And then three astronauts, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chafee, the crew of Apollo 1, died on the launching pad, trapped inside their capsule when fire broke out. These were the first fatalities of the whole program and it was a serious blow. The Apollo 1 fire caused a year-long delay while the capsule was redesigned. And the vehicle to land on the moon was behind schedule as well. By the end of 1968, NASA was struggling on several fronts to meet the decade deadline. And then the Soviets caught the United States by surprise. The CIA had photographs of an enormous Soviet launch complex. It could only mean one thing. They were highly classified photographs of, uh, of sort of suspenseful, because we had to go inside of a, of a glass cage that was inside of a room within NASA. The CIA had produced uh, 
solid intelligence that the Soviets were going to try to circumnavigate the moon before the end of 68. We were impressed. I mean, it, it meant that they, they weren't fooling around. They, they, were, they, were, they were going for the, for the brass ring, too. No question about it. The most recent photograph showed a Soviet rocket even bigger than the Saturn V, already on a launch pad. It was time for NASA to make a very bold decision. On uh, December 21st, the Saturn V will place the spacecraft into a 100-mile uh, orbit around the Earth. But instead of testing Apollo 8 in the Earth's orbit as planned, they would try to fly it all the way around the moon. The last stage of the Saturn V will reignite, placing the spacecraft on a trajectory that will lead it out to the moon. For the first 10 seconds or so, I thought, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard. But then immediately I thought, what a challenge, you know? And it's, it's obviously the right thing to do. It holds the schedule. The lunar module was not going to be ready for the next flight. And uh, it was a bold move. Such a bold move that the astronauts on Apollo 8 would be the first to fly on the redesigned Saturn rocket. There was no time for any more test flights. If there was a single most uh, difficult decision to make in that program, it was deciding to launch three people around the moon after having the, the second Saturn V uh, fail to carry out its mission completely. This was going to be an all-up test all the way to the moon. Engineers have called Apollo 8's plan to orbit the moon 69 miles above its surface the most daring mission of all. On December the 21st, 1968, Frank Borman, James Lovell, and Bill Anders, flying Apollo 8, became the first human beings to ever leave the gravitational pull of the Earth. Following Houston, you are go for staging, over. The moon at the time of Apollo 8 was 230,000 miles from the Earth. And the farthest that any human being had ever been from the Earth before that was 850 miles. If you think about the Earth as a peach, every flight that had been done in Mercury and Gemini and by the Soviets up to that point was pretty much like skimming the peach fuzz. You're not just talking about a longer mission, you're talking about multiplying by a factor of 100 the complexity, the level of risk. Apollo 8 took three days to reach the moon. And the mission required that when they went into lunar orbit to the other side of the moon, they would be completely cut off from the Earth. This is Houston at 6804, your goal for LOI. Okay, Apollo 8 is go. LOI, lunar orbit insertion. The whole world held its breath, including the engineers at NASA. It was like we knew we were waiting for this moment. As we got closer and closer to the eventual point, we're going to lose communications. You know, nobody knew for sure what to say. And then we lost contact. At the exact time we were supposed to lose the radio communication, it went off. I, I think there was some conversation. I said, boy, that's remarkable. And Andrew said something, well, they, they probably turned the goddamn thing off or something like that. I remember sitting there thinking how quiet it's getting, almost to the point of being uncomfortable. It was the only noise I remember hearing. It was just the occasional crack of a radio, a little crack, you know, the normal crackling in the headset you hear on the radio. We were helpless at that point. It was, not, it was all in the hands of the crew and God. There wasn't anything we could do on the ground. Mission Control had calculated that the astronauts would be out of radio contact for exactly 35 minutes, 52 seconds. It was emotional. The physics was all there. It should work. But you know, <laughs> I never did this before. I'm going behind the moon. Nobody's ever done that. You see what I'm saying? While they were on the far side of the moon, Apollo 8 had to use their engine to slow down to actually get into the moon's orbit. And there they were, over the far side of the moon, and they knew that if the engine fired even a second too long, it could crash into the moon. And if it fired too short, they'd end up in some kind of weird orbit. 
and everything depended on that rapid firing. Houston could do nothing but wait. Then we started to get the crackle of, of, of the voice just about the time that we calculated it should come around the corner if the burn went perfectly well. We've got it, uh, we've got it. Apollo uh, 8 now in, in lunar orbit. Uh, there's a cheer in the, this room. Uh, this is so Apollo. just from the crackling sound we got, we had a pretty good indication that the burn had gone well. And then, of course, the crew reported that, uh, that, that exactly that. Okay, uh, Houston, the moon is essentially gray. Uh, the equator craters are all rounded off. There's quite a few of them. Some of our newer. Many of them look like, uh, especially the round ones, look like uh, hit by meteorites or projectiles of some sort. And Bill Anders happened to look out the window and said, oh, my God, look at that. And Borman said, what is it? And, he, and Anders said, it's the Earth coming up. And it was this electrifying contrast between the blue of the Earth, this brilliant blue and white marble, and this desolate, completely lifeless horizon of the moon. It was the only color in the entire universe. Everything else is black and white. But the Earth was blue. You could clearly see the continents. They were sort of a pinkish brown. The clouds were visible. It was a remarkable sight, just a remarkable sight. It makes you realize Right, and of course it was Christmas Eve, and so all of our thoughts were back there anyway with our families and with the people we held dear back on Earth. We went there to see the moon, I thought, and most of the spectacular things I saw were about seeing the Earth from that vantage point. The, the beautiful blue, against the dark black and the fact that the earth looks small and fragile. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. It was a very moving moment. And now, given the presidential challenge, there was only one year left to land on the moon and get home again. January 1969, only a year left to meet President Kennedy's pledge to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. Apollo 8 had been around the moon. The last great challenge was landing on the surface. To do this, NASA designed a highly specialized space vehicle. The lunar module, or the LEM, was NASA's most unusual vehicle because it was the world's first true spaceship designed to fly outside the Earth's atmosphere. It looked like a contraption. And this contraption had four landing legs with great big pads, shock absorbers. It had ladders. It had a crinkly skin around the outside. It had antennas sprouting all over. Regardless of how you look at it, it looks terrible. Functionally, it is ideal. It's all you need. You don't need anything streamlined. Everything can stick out. There's no atmosphere in the moon. See, what do you need? Nothing like that. In March, Apollo 9 took the lunar module into Earth orbit to see how it would perform in space. The LEM undocked and flew 100 miles from the mothership and returned safely. Apollo 10 in May was a full-scale rehearsal for the lunar landing. The spacecraft orbited the moon, and the LEM separated from the command module and made a trial descent down to 50,000 feet above the surface. All that remained for the next mission was an actual landing. The astronauts trained for the lunar descent at a Texas airfield. They flew a vehicle that reproduced the LEM's flying characteristics, a design that had never been used in manned flight before and was very unstable. It was a risky thing to fly that trainer. One day in 1968, Armstrong was flying an early version and he was practicing a landing and it began to gyrate wildly. He was just reaching for the ejection handle 
when the automatic system kicked in and fired him up and away from the trainer. He came down on his parachute and by this time the trainer had crashed and burst into flames. Armstrong developed skills on these test flights that would serve him well when the moment came to land on the moon. July the 16th, 1969, six months before the end of Kennedy's deadline to reach the moon. 9.32 a.m. A Saturn V carrying Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins lifted off from Cape Canaveral. Two and a half hours later, Apollo 11 left Earth's orbit. Traveling at speeds up to 24,000 miles an hour, it would take three days to make the 240,000 mile journey to the moon. Four days into the flight, on the afternoon of July the 20th, with the Apollo in moon orbit now. Hello, Eagle Houston, we're standing by, over. The lunar module separated from the mothership. Houston, we see you on the stairwell, over. Roger, Eagle, done, done. Roger, how does it look? Roger. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin descended towards the moon's surface. Okay, all flight controllers, go, no, go for landing. Retro. Go. Fido. Go. Guide. Go. Control. Go. Telcom. Go. GNC. Go. Ecom. Go. Surgeon. Go. Capcom, we're go for landing. Altitude 4200. You're go for landing, over. The landing on the moon is a race against the clock in the sense that you're trying to get down and the whole time you are, you're running out of fuel. It was a controlled fall. The LEM had enough fuel for one attempt, and if they burned that fuel too quickly, they'd crash. Armstrong noticed that the LEM was about to overshoot its landing point and was heading directly for a field of boulders. Armstrong switched to manual control and quickly performed an evasive maneuver. He then flew five miles across the lunar surface searching for a landing spot that was smooth. Feet, three and a half down, nine forward. Third looking good, down a half. Sixty. Roger. Six forward. Sixty. Sixty Give the crew a sixty second call. Sixty seconds. Right on. Still obvious, they're still above the surface and they're scooting horizontally trying to find a landing point. Up we get now down to 30 seconds fuel remaining, call, and you're now starting to realize this is a horse race. It's going to be close right to this last second. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. And it then takes a second to realize the crew is actually going through the shutdown sequence. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. We had somewhere about between no, no less than seven, no more than 17 seconds of fuel remaining at the time we shut these engines down. And we're getting a picture on the TV. Okay. You got a good picture, huh? Roger, we copy you. Pretty good little jump. And all of a sudden, you could see on the television, it wasn't a very clear picture, but you could see motion. And then you finally could identify legs coming out. And you could see the whole body go down. And the step off the limb. And then you could see the actual step on the moon. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. It was just an absolutely glorious, unbelievable moment. The sense of accomplishment just I think overtook everybody uh, in terms of something that we had all worked together for for years. There will only be one first mission from the Earth to another world. That moment was the beginning of a story that never ends. This was about what humans do. Humans like to explore. And this was exploration on a grand scale. The whole world participated. It was the peacetime event of the century. Over the course of six Apollo missions, 12 Americans walked on the lunar surface. They spent 80 hours driving the lunar buggy to distant craters and mountains, conducting scientific experiments, 
they brought back to Earth 836 pounds of rock and soil. It was indeed a giant leap for mankind, but it was only the beginning. It was extraordinary to watch man walk and sometimes play on the moon. But something strange happened after man got there. Americans, for the most part, became less interested in space exploration. Most, but not all. Finally, in this hour, we're going to put ourselves in the hands of some young scientists and engineers who take us deeper and farther out there than most of us can even imagine. One, zero, and liftoff of the Delta rocket with Mars Pathfinder. And the vehicle has cleared the tower. By December 1996, 27 years after the moon landing, America's space explorers were so much deeper into space. The Pathfinder mission went 309 million miles to Mars to deliver the small unmanned Sojourner rover, which explored the Martian surface. This was 1,200 times farther away than the moon. Sojourner made Mars accessible because it was, it was our eyes and our feet on Mars and we could move and look around and explore more, more than we had ever been able to do before with robotic vehicles. When you see this Martian terrain, you think, I see a horizon, I see rocks, I see orange red soil, I'm in Utah, but you're not in Utah. You're in an ancient floodplain on a world 110 million miles away, and you realize that suddenly the technological tendrils of Earth have reached out and brought these images back to us. It makes us feel infinitely larger and infinitely smaller simultaneously. The Martian landscape was at one time more like Earth. For example, surging water scarred large areas of its surface. Valles Marineros is a canyon so large it could hold the entire Grand Canyon. Mars was a planet that billions of years ago enjoyed an epic where liquid water flowed on its surface. It is bone dry now, freeze dried. How did that happen? Is there any lesson that we can learn by studying Mars about the Earth? If you care about how we got here or why we're here or how long we might be here <laughs> or what might happen to us, in the future, then the planets can give us an idea about that. Until this century, it was assumed the solar system was dead, unchanging. The solar system is alive. It is continuing to change. It's not something which was created four and a half billion years ago and we're seeing it today as it was. We knew that the Earth has changed, but it turns out that even the small worlds in the solar system have changed since their formation and are continuing to change. The Voyager missions have flown hundreds of millions of miles beyond Mars, out beyond the most distant planets of our solar system. They have sent back some of the most startling images of the entire space age. The rings of Saturn were revealed in stunning new detail. Suddenly we found out that there were hundreds of thousands of rings around Saturn. And those rings weren't all circular. Some of them were elliptical and nobody understood how that could be. Some of them looked like they were braided. Nobody understood how that could be. What people had thought of before those pictures as being just this nice, simple demonstration of the way that objects march around the Newtonian orbits around Saturn, instead suddenly became this incredible gravitational ballet with all sorts of wonderful effects that people did not really fully understand. Voyager also captured the violent drama of Jupiter. This planet is so massive, as large as all the other planets combined, that it generates its own heat, adding fuel to its hurricane-like storms. The biggest is called the giant red spot. That storm system is two to three Earths across, and it's just a storm system. What we discovered with Voyager was that that was just the largest of literally dozens of huge hurricane-like storm systems uh, that form and disappear and then reform in Jupiter's giant atmosphere. Voyager discovered what we could not know from Earth. Three completely new moons. Jupiter has 16, not 13. We thought that one moon, Io, was a cold, lifeless rock. And now all of a sudden, out in the outer solar system, here's this dumpy little moon orbiting around Jupiter. 
and it's got volcanoes going off all over the place. And, and these volcanoes are so amazing, blasting material out across the, the surface of the planet, so prolific that the entire surface of the planet remakes itself every few years. But I don't really think people expected it to look the way it did and to have multiple volcanoes going off all at the same time and to have the plumes extruded hundreds of kilometers up and up, up above the surface and uh, for it to look as strange as it looks. It's a very strange place. And now the Voyager spacecraft have gone beyond our own solar system and are heading towards interstellar space. Out there between the stars, NASA believes they'll report back what they can for perhaps another 15 or 20 years. Gazing out beyond even these spacecraft is the Hubble Space Telescope. Positioned in the Earth's orbit, it is the most powerful optical telescope exploring space today. In time, the Hubble telescope may help us comprehend the most fundamental questions of the universe. This is the Eagle Nebula, an immense cloud of gas and dust where stars and planets are being formed. The Eagle Nebula is a reasonably nearby stellar nursery. This particular dust cloud, the largest one, is something like one light year tall, six trillion miles. And so this is an immense region, interior to which are stars are being born and planets are being born. You look at that picture, and in fact, people do look at that picture and say, wow, who painted that? And the answer is nobody painted that. That's something that's really honest to goodness out there. That's part of the universe that we live in. The Hubble telescope is a unique tool, helping us to understand the very origin and evolution of the universe and our place in it. There are more galaxies in the sky than there are stars in our own galaxy. Each one of those galaxies being its own collection of billions or tens of billions or hundreds of billions of stars, each one of which is the result of the same processes that led to the formation of our sun and our earth and our life. Given that, it seems very unlikely that life has not found a foothold somewhere else in the universe as well. We are all from exploding stars. Those are the things that make the carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen, and other elements. Now, that's happened throughout the, the universe. To have that, <laughs> just something special here, well, it's impossible. It's just like it's impossible that this is the only star in the universe, our sun. And I think exploring space, looking out beyond that into our solar system, is going to get us to the point of what, <laughs> what is this all about? Why are we here? Why are we here? How did we get here? The eternal questions. The first step on the moon, as awesome as it seemed at the time, only encouraged us to go farther. If we decided to go to the moon and achieve that, in less than half a generation, there's no reason we couldn't make a similar choice and travel to Mars, travel to one of the moons of Jupiter, even travel outside the solar system. Apollo gave us confidence. I believe that we have to find some way to express ourselves as a world. And I believe that is through the continuing process of exploration and discovery. We're about to enter a new millennium in which we can say with confidence that people will walk on other planets and they might even go to other stars. And as long as humanity exists, we'll be going out into space. Forty years after President Kennedy launched America on a voyage of discovery, there is no turning back. Just as the Renaissance changed forever, humankind's perspective of itself the space age is also changing forever, our perspective of ourselves. We will never again be able to view ourselves as the very parochial little creatures who live within a world defined by what's over the next hill. We're part of the universe, and you can't take that back. I'm Peter Jennings for The Century. Good night.
You can read more about this remarkable time in the century written by Peter Jennings and Todd Brewster, published by Doubleday and sold in bookstores everywhere. Also look for the Century Audiobook Edition, available on compact disc and audio cassette. Inconceivable because until the 1960s, America's rocket program was not a success story. We had a lot of failures, and most people don't realize how many rocket failures we had. Up until about 1960, over half of them failed in very, very spectacular kinds of ways. Astronaut John H. Glenn Jr. goes into final rehearsal as the day approaches for America's first manned orbital flight, a flight that should put the United States on even terms with the Soviet Union in the space race. In February 1962, when John Glenn waited to launch in Friendship 7 on top of an Atlas rocket, NASA's rocket team knew only too well that during the previous tries, the Atlas had worked three times and failed twice. Two of the five previous atlases had failed, Mercury Atlas 1 and 3. I didn't get the job done, so when we launched John Glenn, we didn't know whether we'd have the third bad one or the fourth good one. Think about an atlas rocket, which is full of a couple of hundred thousand pounds of super cold liquid oxygen and kerosene. It's basically a bomb ready to go off at any moment. John Glenn's famous joke was he looked around and thought about the fact that everything was built by the lowest bidder. Exist for carrying that fire. What a fantastic experience it must have been, Lindbergh wrote, alone, looking down on another celestial body like a god of space. To be alone and then return to one's fellow man once more. Tonight on the century, heaven and earth. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. I thought that was the dumbest thing I'd ever heard of in my life because we did not have the uh, facilities, we did not have the rocket engines, we did not have the life support systems, we didn't have the entry systems. Many of the engineers in America's struggling space program were stunned by the president's proposal. Kennedy's commitment meant sending men 240,000 miles out into space. I couldn't believe it. I said, what, we're going to the moon? That's quite an undertaking, you know. When are we going to do it? For me, it was just a, a staggering kind of a thing because what we were proposing to do was so much larger, so much more powerful, so much more capable and anything that we'd even tried to do in, in the Mercury days. I was uh, down in the trenches. I was trying to look upward and trying to find a way to put a man in space, period. Putting a man on the moon was something that, to me, was inconceivable. like it in history. 35 years ago, Gotham went wild over Lindbergh when he returned from his solo hop across the Atlantic. And there have been many wild receptions to returning heroes since. But today, tops them all. As Colonel John H. Glenn... America was delighted with its newest space hero. But to get to the moon, NASA had to build a rocket 25 times as powerful as the one that took up John Glenn. 
Kennedy saw a prototype of this new rocket when he visited the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. The entire Apollo program depended on developing a moon rocket called the Saturn. In the last 24 hours, we have felt the ground shake and the air shattered by the testing of a Saturn C-1 booster rocket, many times as powerful as the Atlas which launched John Glenn. Kennedy's decision led to almost warlike mobilization of financial and human resources. NASA budget went at 80% the first year, 100% the second year. We made capital investments in building facilities all over the country. We created a new space center in Houston. So this was a really peaceful equivalent of, of a war campaign to get this done. Nothing was more important than creating the massive Saturn rocket. It was huge. The design of the engines, you know, were beyond state of the art, let's say. It was tremendous. I mean, you cannot appreciate that till you see the size of a man stacked up against that whole thing. But very quickly, the Saturn program fell behind schedule. And in 1963, an engineer named George Miller was put in charge of the manned flight program. He was not very optimistic about meeting the president's deadline. If you just looked at the schedule of what had to be done in order to get to the moon in that decade, there was only one way to do it, and that is to go for all-up testing of the vehicle. All-up testing. It was a radical approach to rocket development. It meant that various stages of the rocket would no longer be tested one piece at a time, which was the safe way to go, but all the pieces would be put together and tested for the first time when the rocket took off, if it did. The people at NASA were incredulous that anyone could propose to take a, a brand new rocket and fire it with more than one stage at a time. George Miller convinced us not with the technical argument, but with the psychological argument. From ABC News. A television event. 100 years in the making. A century. In July 1969, nearly a million people gathered on a steamy Florida morning, hoping to see a dream realized that's as old as man's imagination. Among them, virtually unrecognized, a silver-haired flyer from another time. In 1927, Charles Lindbergh had guided his simple single-engine plane on a celebrated journey across the ocean and into history. And here, only 42 years later, three men are waiting to go to the moon on the most powerful machine man has ever built. Lindbergh wrote later to one of the Apollo 11 astronauts, my chest was beating and the ground shook as though bombs were falling nearby. And then a flame rose, leaving the ground behind, a meteor streaking the sky. It seemed impossible for life to be.